I'd like to have you uh, look at a verse from Philippians 3.10 that uh, we're going to put on the screen. And I want you to look at it with me, if we would, as we spend some time in the Word together today. Some of you might even say that this is your life verse. Certainly one that has had a great impact in my own life. Philippians 3.10, Paul wrote it, I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul said, I want to know Christ. Now that seems like a perfectly normal thing to say until you realize that the Apostle Paul wrote it sometime during the last 10 years of his life. And you say, isn't that that, that something that you say on on the front end of your relationship with Christ? Why would you say that in the last 10 years of your Christian experience? And Paul says it as if it has not fully happened yet. I want to know Christ. It's important for us to uh, ponder this point today. No doubt many people attending churches today know about Christ. They know about his, his, this, the historic Jesus. They know about His birth. They know about His crucifixion for our sins. No one says that I want to know George Washington. Why? Well, because he died 217 years ago this week. All you can do is know about George Washington. Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection. He's alive. And if He's alive, I want to know Him. He's talking about experiencing the living Christ. Experiencing a person is altogether different than knowing about a person. It's one thing to see a photograph of a gourmet meal prepared by a world-renowned chef. It's another thing to be savoring that meal. It's one thing to see a man kissing a beautiful woman. It's another thing to be that man. It's one thing to hear about a gorgeous sunset. It's another thing to be sitting on the perfect sand of a Hawaiian beach to experience it firsthand. It's one thing to know about Christ. It's another thing to know Christ and His resurrection power. Last week from Ephesians chapter 3, we talked about a, a knowing that surpasses knowledge. Paul is praying that the Ephesians would have an experience of God's love. That they would experience His love to the extent that they could grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. We ask, how much does God love us? It's a love so profound so utterly beyond mere knowledge that to grasp it is to experience the greatest treasure in the universe. There is no other love. And so Paul says, I want to know Him. Even even to the point of taking up my own cross to follow Him. I will share in His sufferings gladly just to know and experience this love that surpasses knowledge. Now, that's all good and right and biblically sound. There's nothing of what I just said there that is out in left field somewhere. The possibility exists of knowing the living Christ. And I want to tell you that that's what I want. That's what I've wanted my whole life. And here I am in the final stretch of my vocational ministry and I still 
like Paul, want to know Christ. The issue is what that looks like in real life. I mean, if you and I were to know Christ in this way, what would we have done during the course of our life? If you and I are to know Christ, as I've just described, what would we do in real life? Well, that's the million-dollar question. Right now at Mac, we're in a, the Heroes series. I've chosen several of my own heroes in my Christian experience. Not people that I worship, but people who have inspired me to worship Christ. And by the way, the last hero will be on Christmas Eve, and, and Jesus will be our hero that evening. I hope that you'll be able to join us. Ten years ago, I was reading a book by Dallas Willard titled The Great Omission. Dallas Willard was a professor of philosophy at USC, a true lover of Christ. He died three years ago at the age of 77. I highly esteem him, and I have uh, several of his readings, uh, his writings that, that I have thoroughly gone through. I wish he was still alive. I wish he was publishing because I would buy anything that he uh, wrote. But in the, the last few chapters of this book, he did something even better than publishing another book. He talked about, in, in the back of this book, some of the most significant authors who influenced his life. One chapter in particular caught my attention. It began with this sentence. The one book, other than the Bible, that has most influenced me is a little-known book by James Gilchrist Lawson called Deeper Experiences of Famous Christians, published in 1911. I could hardly believe what I just read. Are you kidding me? Dallas Willard is telling me the most influential book that he's ever read, second only to the Bible. Well, I thought to myself, I've got to get that book. And, I, and so I did. I went online, and strangely, I found it for free. <laughs> when does that happen? I found it for free. All I had to pay for was shipping. And I tell you what, I have scoured this book. It's a book of short stories of various high-profile Christians that you and I would say definitely came to know Christ. Stories of John Wesley, of John Bunyan, Calvin, Savonarola, Fenelon, and many others. But the one person who captured my attention and the hero at this point in our series is a woman named Madame Gail, the, the celebrated French mystic. I imagine that most of us in this room have never even heard her name, Madame Gail. What I'd like to do is give you the short synopsis of her life, which is amazing. And then after that, I'd like to draw just a few conclusions in five minutes as we come to a close. And hopefully those conclusions will be instructive for you and deeply meaningful to you as they've been to me. Madame Gaon, pr pronounced Gaon was one of the greatest Christian leaders of all time. Again, I imagine that some of us have never even heard her name. Not only did she have a tremendous influence in France, but on the whole world. John Wesley and other great spiritual leaders have written that they were greatly indebted to Madame Guillaume for her deep spiritual lessons and writings. She was Roman Catholic, living in the mid-1600s. Her, her maiden name was Mademoiselle de la Muth. At the age of 10, having had some very traumatic experiences in a boarding school in France, experiences that would be inappropriate 
for me to describe here. She found a, a Bible that was somehow left in her chamber. And even at the age, the young age of 10, she became deeply absorbed in reading it. She writes, and I quote, I spent whole days in reading it, giving no attention to other books or other subjects from morning to night, and having great powers of recollection. That's her saying in those ancient days, I've got a great memory. I committed to memory the historical parts entirely. Now I want to tell you, those are the parts of the Bible that I have trouble with. I can't remember them. She remembered them entirely. Even so, at the age of 12, her religion was mainly in appearance. And the love of Christ had not yet captured her heart. She grew tall, and her features began to develop to the extent that her mother, pleased with her appearance, indulged her in fashion and the fashion world. Fully immersed in, in beauty and fashion, she found herself pulled away by the world, and soon Christ was all but forgotten. But she encountered a missionary who was going to China, and while her encounter with this missionary was very brief, as a result of that interaction, she resolved to give up her worldliness and to return to her religion. She kicked it into high gear, visiting the poor, giving away food and clothing, teaching others about God, spending much time in reading and in prayer. But at the age of 14, she fell deeply in love with a young man. That's right, at the age of 14. And so it was no surprise to me when I read that uh, this is the precise time that her parents decided to move the family to Paris. And it was here in Paris that Mademoiselle de la Muth, tall and beautiful, bright and having brilliant skills of conversation, became a favorite of Parisian society. And she all but forgot about God. Multiple men pursued her for marriage. One man in particular was approved by her father, a very wealthy man, and so her father arranged the marriage. The wedding took place in 1664. Her new husband, Jacques Guéon, was 38 years old. She was 16. And at the age of 16, she became Madame Guéon. She did love him, but she never bargained on what she would experience in her mother-in-law, who seemed to exist primarily to make her miserable. One year after the wedding, at the age of 17, she gave birth to a son. At the age of 19, she gave birth to a second son. At the age of 21, she gave birth to their third child, a daughter. And the thought of raising these three beautiful children caused her heart to return to God. But it was not long before she became very sick and almost died. It was then that a Franciscan monk came to her bedside and in talking with her led her to see clearly her need to seek Christ through faith and not through works alone as she had been doing up to this time. This was news to her. She had never heard anything like this, and so she responded by simply placing her faith in Jesus. And she writes, and I quote, I felt at this instant deeply wounded with the love of God, a wound so delightful that I desired it, might, it, it never might be healed, unquote. 
And nothing was easier to her than the practice of prayer. She writes, It was a prayer of rejoicing and possession, wherein the taste of God was so great, so pure, so unblended and uninterrupted that it drew and absorbed the powers of the soul to a state of confiding and affectionate rest in God, existing without intellectual effort, unquote. Even after that, still, a couple years later, on a return trip to Paris with her husband, she found herself once again drawn into that society and walking away for God, from God in some measure. It was only for a period of days, but realizing this, she felt great remorse for having so easily been drawn away from the Lord. The book says that she yearned for someone to instruct her in how to live a more consistent spiritual life. Well, one day as she was walking across the river Seine in Paris, on her way to Notre Dame Church. A poor man dressed in religious garb suddenly stepped up next to her as she was walking, joined her, and entered into conversation with her. She writes that this man spoke to me in a wonderful manner of God and, and divine things. He seemed to know everything about her, about her history, her strengths, her weaknesses. And there talking with her as they walked, he helped her to understand that God required not merely a heart of which it could be said it was forgiven, but a heart which could properly and in some real sense be designated holy. The Spirit of God bear witness to what he said. And right there at Notre Dame Church, she resolved, and I quote, from this day, this hour, if it be possible, I will be wholly the Lord's. The world shall have no portion in me. She yielded herself without reserve to the will of God. She was 22. And wow, to read the rest of her story is to be sobered by the avalanche that follows. Soon, she was stricken with a powerful form of smallpox so devastating was this form of smallpox that her outward beauty was permanently destroyed. But to her own amazement, she experienced joy unspeakable. Something is different this time, her story reveals. Not long after, her youngest son died. And she writes, and I quote, this blow struck me to the heart. I was overwhelmed, but God gave me strength in my weakness." Unquote. One year later, her beloved father died. And then in the same year, her little three-year-old daughter died. And then her husband died. She herself was 28 years old. And now the weight of these great losses led her into a period of seven years of severe depression. I mean, she lost all joy and all emotion completely flat. And during this seven years, however, she desperately wanted to escape this depression. She could not figure out how possibly to pull herself out of it. And so she began to correspond with Father Lacombe, 
a man that she had led to faith in Christ years earlier. And on July 22nd, 1680, she and Father Lacombe in separate cities entered into an entire day of fasting and prayer for her situation. She writes that the clouds of darkness lifted from her soul and floods of glory took their place. The Holy Spirit opened her eyes to see that her afflictions were God's mercies in disguise. She writes, and I quote, in a wonderful manner, difficult to explain, all that which had been taken from me was not only restored, but restored with increase and new advantages. In thee, O oh my God, I found it all, and more than all. I was brought into such harmony with the will of God that I might now be said to possess not merely consolation, but the God of consolation. Not merely peace, but the God of peace. Unquote. What happens next takes her story to a whole new level. Now, revivals across France began in almost every place that she visited and taught. Her influence became so great that King Louis XIV, the evil king in France in that day, imprisoned her in a convent. But her suffering there actually served to make her stronger and more effective. When that didn't work, King Louis XIV imprisoned her in the castle of Vincennes. Again, it made no difference. The next year, he placed her in a dungeon in the Bastille, the historic and dreaded prison of Paris, where for four years she lived in that dungeon. She became a prolific writer there. And in 1702, she was banished to Blois, where she spent the remainder of her life. She died in perfect peace and joy at the age of 69. She left behind some 60 volumes of her writings. In this book that I found, the last few lines are lines from her own pen in which she writes, To me remains no place nor time. My country is in every clime. I can be calm and free from care on any shore since God is there. Why is Madame Guéon one of my heroes? <laughs> well, I have several conclusions to draw from, uh, from her life and as an answer to that question. And my hope is that these are meaningful to you as they've been meaningful to me. Three conclusions. Here's one. There is more of Christ to experience. There is more of Christ to experience. Knowing Christ is a lifelong quest. It doesn't matter where you're at in your walk with God, whether you are seasoned and mature or young and, and uh, inexperienced in your walk with God. It matters not. There is more of God to experience. And I want to tell you today, I want to encourage you, if I can, not to settle for the prayer you prayed when you came to faith in Christ. Mac, if I could be a spiritual father to you, I want to encourage you, do not rely on your beginnings. Do not settle for the prayer you prayed when you came to faith in Christ. Why? Because the possibility is real that in desiring more of God, He will honor that desire. 
2 Chronicles 16, 9, the eyes of the Lord range to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. The eyes of the Lord are looking for you, looking to see your desire, looking to see your hunger for more, and God's commitment is to strengthen you for that desire. There is more of Christ to experience. Madame Gaon's life was a story of downs and ups. Downs and ups. Your story may be similar on some level. I'm saying to you today, on the basis of Scripture, there is more of Christ to experience. Here's another. To know Christ is to have found a treasure more important than anything than, than life can throw at you. To know Christ is to have found a treasure more important than anything life can throw at you. You know, my guess, even as we're talking about this, is that some of us may be thinking, well, I don't want to pursue more of Christ for what that may mean. It may mean that someone close to me dies. It may mean that I get really sick or that I suffer on some level, and I don't want that. I'd rather just stay below the radar, stay out of sight. And I don't think that I want to go out on a limb and say, I want more of Christ. But I want you to think of it this way, Mac. What life would you be willing to live if you knew in experience that you had found the greatest treasure in the universe? Let me say that one more time. What life would you be willing to live if you knew in experience that you had found the greatest treasure in the universe. In the Gospel of John, Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he says to them, are you going to leave me too? Peter was a representative of the group and responded on behalf of all of them and said, oh Lord, where are we going to go? You hold the words of life. Where are we going to go? They had found the treasure. And whether life was difficult or not, they couldn't imagine being anywhere else than knowing Jesus and relating to Jesus. One more. And this one is so important. Driving a stake of surrender into the ground is the key to your future experience of Christ. Did you hear that? Driving a stake of surrender into the ground is the key to your future experience of Christ. Madame Guéon did that at Notre Dame Church in Paris. I'm all yours, Lord. I hold nothing back. And that was the beginning of Christ pouring out his love into her heart. And it's the difference in her story. And I resonated with this so much because it was like my own experience. I remember sitting in the front seat of a Crown College van parked in a parking lot. I was sitting on the passenger side all by myself at the age of 21, reading Watchman Nee's book, The Normal Christian Life. And I saw that the normal Christian life was a life of complete surrender to Christ, holding nothing back. And I sat at the crossroads there in the middle of that, in the front seat of that van, 
deciding, do I want to surrender all? And I remember, I remember like it was yesterday, I surrendered there in the front seat of that van saying, God, I give you everything. You can have all of me. And I can tell you that God has been so faithful to reveal his love over and over again. I will be the first to tell you that I've failed many times. I have experienced some tremendous blessings and I've experienced some very difficult things. But because of Christ, I consider myself one of the most blessed men on earth. And to this day, I say, I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. Because in Christ, I found the greatest treasure of the universe. And I wouldn't change it for nothing. I'm going to ask our worship team to come and trying to think through how to bring closure to this time. I have no notes at this point. I simply want to say to you that we've tried in this next few moments to create some space for you. And uh, I think what I want to ask is what do you want? What do you want? You want to know Christ? You want to have a neat and tidy walk with God? One where you just stay below the radar and do your thing? Or is there something about what we've dealt with today in Philippians 3.10 where you say, I want to know Christ? And I surrender all. What do you want? I'm going to lead us in a song and in this next song here. I want to encourage you. You don't have to sing. I just want to create some space for you to respond to God. What do you want? What do you want to say to God? Use this time well. <laughs>